You found a podcast where you'll hear the truth, and we will praise Jesus' name. We stand for the Bible and won't back down from it, although it don't bring much fame. Some folks will like it, some will try to deny it, but God's word will always stand true. It's been tried in the fire, still good. Hello, friends and faithful listeners. It's time for the Pod King Bible Study, and I'm your co-host, Donald King, and I'm joined by the host of this study, Brother Donnie King. On this podcast, we study the Bible from its original languages so we can understand the Word of God more clearly. We look at current events and news in light of scriptures, and we also examine some of the things going on within our culture from a biblical perspective. This is Monday, January the 8th, episode number 150, Is He Coming? John 7, 2 through 19. In our last episode, we tapped into the root source of where all of the idols, gods, and goddesses came from from. You might be surprised at where we began and even more surprised at where we end up. I'm sure some of you may be thinking we're making too big of a deal out of this topic, but trust me, this isn't just some kind of a hobby horse I like riding. This is a real problem in our world, even today in America. We have been saturated by a culture that has evil undertones built into the very fabric of it. Where did this come from? If you can answer that question, then you already know where all the idols came from too. Come on and listen in today. In today's study, we discussed how the Feast of Tabernacles was nearing and how everyone was so concerned about whether or not Jesus was coming to it. Jesus told his unbelieving brothers that his time was not yet, and he allowed them to leave for the feast without him. Then he secretly went up to the feast, but he didn't stay undercover for long. He shows up and immediately begins teaching in the temple. A dispute gets started pretty quickly, and many other things begin to happen in this setting. We invite you to join in with us on this study today. Now for the lesson and the teaching of God's Word, I'll turn it to the host of our podcast, Brother Donnie King. Well, we want to thank you for tuning in with the Pod King Bible Study once again. You're in for another lesson full of interesting tidbits and biblical truth. Boy, I just think you could be listening to something of no value or something that won't better your spiritual walk with the Lord. But thankfully, you have chosen something good today. Yes, yeah, just like what Jesus told Martha about Mary. She's chosen that good part. <laughs> <laughs> well, how did I know you'd have to end up taking this and going off the edge with it? <laughs> oh, I'm just trying to bring everything back to the scriptures. Well, I don't have a problem with you taking stuff to the scriptures. I just think it's taking it too far to act like they're tuning in to Jesus when they come on this program. Well, if they're not coming for Jesus, who would you rather than be tuning in for? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Forget it anyway. There are more pressing matters at hand. Uh, what kind of reaction are you wanting to get from the audience by your title today? Well, I want it to provoke a specific image in their mind. Well, it'd be pretty easy for some to see this title and assume it will be about the second coming of Christ. Yeah, when I, I, I put the title down, I thought, you know, it's kind of possible they might think that, but they'll quickly see what the main point truly is. I named it, Is He Coming?, with a little background story in mind. Well, I should have known. I guess this is where you're going to throw in your joke for the week. No, but years ago, my wife and I used to babysit a little boy. We took him in around 18 months old, and we watched him until he turned eight. His parents were Baptist ministers, and they left him with us one time when they went to Honduras for a couple of weeks. Yeah, you know, I remember that. You were pastoring in Henderson, Kentucky at that time. Yeah, so on the way to church, that boy asked me, said, why are we going to church on Wednesday? I told him, I said, well, we go to church three times a week, and we're heading there tonight because Jesus is going to show up and visit with us. He seemed to be pretty pleased with my answer, and he just dropped it, and we went on with the conversation. We got to church, and that boy kept roaming back and forth, and he'd head over towards the door, and he'd look out the windows, and he'd look out the door, and we were kind of having a hard time keeping him occupied. And I finally asked him, I said, what are you doing? And he asked me, he said, well, is he coming? <laughs> well, I had no idea what the kid was talking about, so I asked him, I said, who? He said, Jesus, you said he was coming for a visit tonight. And he said, I've never seen him at my church before. <laughs> and that honestly happened. <laughs> you know, I remember that happening. And nearly everyone heard him say that. And the whole church cracked up for sure. Yeah, I know it. But uh, I wonder, has he ever been to your church? <laughs> All right, I'm going to get us started today and hope that he shows up on this program as well. I'm going to read John chapter 7, verses 2 down through 10 to get us going. 
Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. His brethren therefore said unto him, Depart hence, and go into Judea, that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, shew thyself to the world. For neither did his brethren believe in him. Then Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Well, it says the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brethren started talking to him and said, Won't you depart and go on up into Judea so your disciples may see the works that you do? If you'll remember back in John 6 and 4, it had just told us right then in the previous chapter that the feast of the Passover was near. That means that it was early to mid-spring at that point. John now clues us in on the time frame again because he says the Feast of Tabernacles is at hand. What does that mean as far as the time frame? Okay, well, what that means is, is this was in the fall. Okay, so John's telling us that nearly six months had passed since the last ordeal in the synagogue happened back in chapter 6. That's right, and we know that God instituted the Feast of Tabernacles back in Leviticus 23, I think it's somewhere down around verse 34, and he told them how to do it, what to do, and when to do this. Why do you think the half-brothers of Jesus told him he needed to leave and go into Judea at this point? I find this very interesting. Well, I've wondered if it was because they knew that that was the exact area where the people were wanting to kill him at. (laughs) Were they trying to help him get killed right here? Well, I know that might sound wacky to some people, but we must at least consider it's a viable possibility. You know they had to understand that they were wanting to kill him in that area, and for them to be pushing him to go, it makes you wonder. It's also possible that they were hoping that if he was truly who he said he was, that he would perform some kind of signs or miracles to prove who he was. The other interesting thing here is that they mentioned his disciples, and they implied these disciples needed to see the works that he does. His 12 disciples already believed in him and on him, so what do they mean by this? Yeah, it makes me wonder, could this be a reference back to the disciples in John 6 and 66 who had left him? Remember, many turned and walked away from him, and they didn't follow him anymore. Were they trying to tell him he needed to go back and win these disciples to him by working wonders? You know, I'm not 100% sure, but either way, it certainly appears that they were being sarcastic at the least, and most likely they were pretty much being hateful and mocking him is the way I interpret this. They told Jesus in verse 4 and 5, There's no man that does anything in secret, for he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for neither did his brethren believe in him. The half-brothers of Jesus continued their speech by telling him that nobody does stuff in secret if they want to be openly known. You know, this is puzzling. What did that mean by all of this? To me, it seems that they were basically mocking him for laying low over the past few months. They said if he does these things, then he needed to show himself to the world. What things? Well, I'm not really sure. But in other words, they were telling him, if you're who you say you are, you need to be known by everyone. They didn't say these things because they believed on him and they wanted his identity to be known by everyone. There's another purpose behind this. No, they did this because they didn't believe in him. Yeah, and doesn't it make you wonder why they doubted him? Jesus never sinned. They never caught him in a lie. They never saw him steal. They never heard him sass his parents or cuss or do anything like that. Could it be that he was such a shining example of perfection that they inwardly hated him like Cain hated Abel? Yeah, and I've even wondered if it may have been like Joseph and his brothers, how his brothers hated him. And I I don't know. Maybe all of that's at play here. It seems to me that Psalm 69 and 8 describes this situation. Psalm 69 and 8 says, I am become a stranger under my brethren and an alien under my mother's children. It's really odd that it specifically makes a distinction between these siblings and says my mother's children. Jesus was the son of his mother, but not the son of Joseph. Their true accusation against him is that no one could claim to be who he supposedly is, and there be no works that go along with it to back those claims. When they said that he should seek to be known openly, they used a Greek word parisia here. Parisia interprets as outspoken, to speak frankly, and to be risky in a dangerous situation. So they were challenging him to go and openly take a chance by telling the whole world. 
But they were taunting him and basically daring him to do this. That's kind of the way I look at it, that they were trying to taunt him to do it or either daring him or trying to push him to do it at the least. So Jesus tells him that his time's not yet come. And then he tells him, your time has already come. The world can't hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Then he tells him, go on up to the feast. I go not up yet into this feast, for my time is not yet full come. All right. When Jesus answers them and says that his time has not yet come, it's connected to what happens later in this chapter in verse 30. All right. He made that same kind of statement back in John 2 and 4, and he'll make it again in John 8 and 20. It's very common for him to say that. He said that their time is always ready. And then he took it further by saying that the world can't hate them as it hates him. I think he was given the reason for this because of what he said. I testify against the world because its works are evil. Yeah, and we need to understand what is meant by the world here also. I was wondering about that. Is this talking about the actual earth or is this speaking of the people on earth? Some people believe this word cosmos should be understood as the whole universe. Well, using Jesus' own usage of the term, I believe he's speaking only about the people that's in the world. I really do. As a matter of fact, his testimony against the world is seen in John 3 and 19 very clearly. Remember, they didn't like the light because their deeds were evil. He brought that witness with him. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense to me, though. Well, this phrase is stated here in the present tense, and it should be understood as I am testifying, not just I testified, which means that he's not referring to one particular time this has happened. This is for any and all times. Yeah, I feel like I have to address the elephant in the room, though. Jesus told his brothers to go on up to the feast, and then he almost makes it sound as if he isn't going to the feast. He even explained why by saying, my time has not yet fully come. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, yeah, that's going to be something that we're going to have to look into the next verses to get a little more information about. There's a word here in the Greek, pleru, and it's usually defined as fulfilled. When he says, my time's not fully come, it means my time is not yet fulfilled. I want to look a little deeper into what you just asked, and I think we can figure it out by using the next two scriptures with it. So let me read those. When he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. These two verses right here tell us that once Jesus said these things, he stayed in Galilee. Yeah, but he stayed there until after his brothers left for the feast. As soon as they left, he then left too. True, and John tells us that he didn't go up openly, but he went up secretly, kind of like in a hidden manner. Let me go ahead and read the remainder of our passage today. That's verse 11 down through 19, because there's a few things that's held within this that's really going to help us uncover what's going on. I want you to see the full thing. Jesus tells them a couple of times, go on up. I'm not going right now. As soon as they leave, he left. It looks really, really odd. I've heard some people say that Jesus told a lie here. So we're going to have to dig into this and see what's going on in these scriptures. John 7 and 11 through 19. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he's a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? All right, in verse 11 and 12, it says that the Jews sought him at the feast, and they all began asking, where is he? Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some was calling him a good man, and others were saying, no, he's just a deceiver of the people. All right, so we see why Jesus waited to go up and then went up secretly. It was because the Jews were definitely waiting on him. If you remember, they were wanting to kill him. And so there's a reason why Jesus is doing what he's doing. They were looking for him at the feast. And now you see the reason for the title that I gave it. Is he coming? Is he coming? Do you think he's going to show up? Do you think he's coming? This is pretty common because we see it in John 11 and 56. The people were waiting on him. They were waiting on him. They were waiting on him. You know what? We're still waiting on him today, but in a different manner. That's right. (laughs) Who do you reckon they were asking? Where is he? Were they asking his family or his brothers these things? Or 
Or they just simply ask one another. Well, obviously there were many people talking about him. And John says there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. So there was a lot of people talking. I don't know that they were talking to his family in particular, but they were definitely talking about him regardless. I'm sure some of them asked his family when they saw them, hey, is Jesus coming? You think he's going to show up? Why ain't he with y'all? The Greek word for much here is polis. Polis is defined as a great deal or a large amount. So there's a great deal of people, a large amount of people looking for him. John has also given us the idea that Jesus may have been out of the public view for a few months, but everybody is still talking about him. Even though he's been out of the public view for maybe even six months, the whole conversation is about Jesus. Well, as always, Jesus is the source of discussion for a lot of people. We can tell what they were saying about him probably was more of the negative sort because they were murmuring and not talking openly. We'll see this happen again later in this same chapter down in verse 43. You know, John recorded a little bit of their conversation. Some were saying that he was a good man. Yeah, and it's good that they at least noticed this much about him, but that's still not good enough. But then you have others who argued against even this lowly opinion of him and say, nay, he's just deceiving the people. Yeah, and this would also be reiterated later in this chapter by the Pharisees in verse 47. We'll get there eventually, but right now I want to stick with the thread that we're looking at here in verses 11 through 19. The Greek word planao means to lead somebody astray, and that's what they were saying when they said he was deceiving the people. It means to lead someone astray on purpose. This was their strongest accusation against Christ in a good while. What did they believe he was leading them astray with? Well, their biggest argument that they had against him was healing a man on the Sabbath day. They really thought this was a form of deception because they were so intent on keeping their traditions, their Mishnah, and all the rabbinical oral laws. They were trying to say he was a deceiver when he said that you don't have to abide by certain things they had always kept. My, my. He is the way, and they were afraid he'd lead people astray and deceive them. Just look at how warped these people were. That's right. In verse 13, 14, and 15, it says, Howbeit no man spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught, and the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? I believe verse 13 gives us a lot of much-needed information. Those who were murmuring and talking about Jesus is not the same group of Jews that was looking for him at the feast. Oh, really? That's interesting. Yeah, well, at the same feast, we have a group of Jews from Judea that's looking for Jesus so they can argue with him and hopefully catch him in something. You know, at the same time, we have the rest of the people talking about him quietly and secretly for fear that these Jews might catch wind of it. These Jews held a lot of power over the people, for John speaks of the fear of the Jews often. Yeah, that's for sure. For a small sampling of it, you see it right here, John 9 and 22, John 12 and 42, John 19 and 38, and John 20 and 19. Sadly, many people today do what they do, refrain from what they refrain from because of the fear of a certain group or certain people. The crowds allowed the bullies of their day to keep them from believing in the Messiah. But, you know, the people seemed to want to believe in him, but because the rulers and leaders didn't accept him, they rejected him as well. Yeah, and that illustrates how much power, control, and authority leaders have over people. John says it was during the middle of the feast that Jesus either shows up or at least makes his presence known. The Feast of Tabernacles was a seven-day feast. So somewhere near the middle, he went into the temple and began to teach. To me, this is an amazing point. He's been laying low, and everybody's been looking for him for a long time. And all of a sudden, he's in the temple teaching as if he owned the place. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder the Jews marveled at this. Yeah, well, they marvel for a couple of reasons, I'm sure. But mainly because they recognized that he knew letters, but he had never learned. How'd they know that? Well, they were saying that he didn't know and hadn't learned because he wasn't taught by them. He hadn't been taught by the rabbis in the local synagogue. <laughs> in other words, he didn't go to our Bible college. Yeah, this man can't teach like that. Who does he think he is? How did they know that he had never learned? Were they the only ones who could train somebody? They were astonished, amazed, and they wondered at what he knew. Their recognition that he knew letters is the Greek word grammar. It interprets as he had expertise of written literature. This expertise was of the scriptures in particular, and that is usually acquired by instruction and by the receiving of an education. You know, they claimed he was not learned, so how should we understand that? Well, I want to begin by saying that this doesn't mean that he was dumb or ignorant. I I don't even think that they were calling him dumb or ignorant here. Let me explain what they were talking about. This is the Greek word manthano. 
Manthano is described as taught, which has the insinuation inherent within it that Jesus was not taught by a recognized rabbi. In Jesus' time, it was normal for some of the Jewish men to be able to read and to have a rudimentary knowledge of Scripture. Yeah, you know, but Jesus was teaching as one of the educated rabbis, and this startled the Jews. Yeah, well, anyone who didn't study under a notable rabbi was looked down upon. Basically, all of the students would refer to their teacher while giving their discourse. Jesus taught with his own authority, which was the same authority as the Father had. That's right, and he had no need to cite Hillel or Shammai or anyone else for that matter because he was talking with the authority. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. All right, verse 16 and 17, Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. It appears that the Jews must have asked these questions out loud, or at the very least, we know that Jesus perceived them, for he levels an answer right back at them. Yeah, he told them that his doctrine is not only his, but his that sent him. Yeah, well, he says that different times throughout this book. He says it again in John 8 and 28, John 12 and 49, and John 14 and 24. You know, Jesus tells them that if any man would do the will of God, then he'll know whether the doctrine is of God or not. He will also know if Jesus is only speaking of himself or of God. In other words, Jesus is telling them at least two things right here. Number one, they should know the scriptures well enough that they could tell if he was teaching falsely or truly. Secondly, anyone who believes the doctrine of the Father should believe on Jesus, and they would know that his witness is true. Well, their problem was that they knew the doctrine, but not his doctrine. Yeah, they had their own doctrine. Yeah. Another problem they had is that they knew the scriptures, but they had no clue who they were about. You know, that word doctrine we see right here is didache. Didache speaks of teachings and godly instruction. So they knew the teachings of God. They knew godly instruction, but yet they didn't understand the godly instructor or the teacher when he appeared. Jesus continues his speech to them in the last two verses that we're going to be looking at. Let me read those. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. Did not Moses give you the law, and yet none of you keepeth the law? Why go ye about to kill me? Jesus tells the crowd that the one who speaks of himself is seeking his own glory. Then he says he's seeking the glory of the one who sent him. He then says that the one who seeks the glory of the Father is true, and there is no unrighteousness in him. That's a pretty major statement right there. (laughs) Yeah. Jesus just declared that he is the one that God sent them, which should have riled them pretty good. And we find out it did. It really did. We'll find that out next week. But anyway, you can go ahead and read that verse 20 on down. But the amazing part is that he said he has no unrighteousness or sin within him. He used the Greek word adikia here, which means he has no injustice within him. He has nothing wrong within him or inside of him. It also means that you could find no iniquity within him. Not only is he claiming to be sent from heaven by God, but he's also claiming to be sinless at the same time. Yeah, well, you know, this is more than they could handle. And we'll see how upset they get in a couple of verses. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) He knows their hearts because he goes straight to the root of the problem, and he reminds them that Moses gave them the law, but not a one of them were keeping it. Well, you know, this is not a light or flippant accusation. He was basically telling them they were full of sin and headed to hell. That's what he said. <laughs> yeah, that, that is right. And it's pretty amazing because he was in the temple when he said these things. It isn't like they were standing out in the street. He's standing there right in the middle of the temple, and they're afraid to do anything. He also said that there was none of them there that kept the law. What a statement. There's nobody here that's keeping the law. Now, think about that. There were doctors of the law. There were rabbis. There were teachers. The priest, the Levites, all of these people were scripture studiers. And he says, ain't none of y'all keeping this law. You know, we've already seen John make the point that Moses gave the Jews the law in John 1 and 17. We also discussed whether it was Moses or God who gave them the law. And I figure the audience remembers that process. Yeah, let me give a brief refresher in case somebody has forgotten that. God gave Moses the law to give unto Israel. So technically Moses did give them the law, but the law came from God. But here's the problem. The Jews recognized Moses as the main lawgiver because of all this. They cut God out and just looked to Moses. This is where they went wrong. They looked at their forefather greater than their father, which is in heaven. Now, could I tell us today that if we look to a man who gave us the word of God as greater than God himself, 
we're full of idolatry in our own hearts. Amen. Before the people can ask Jesus about his accusation, stating that none of them keeps the law, he then explains to them why he said that. He accused them of wanting to kill him by asking them, why were they going about to kill him? This is so astounding. He's done nothing but good. He healed a man on the Sabbath, and now they're wanting to kill him. We see this thought often throughout John's gospel, though. We see it in John 5 and 16, John 5 and 18, John 7 and 1, John 7 and 25, John 8 and 37, John 8 and 40, John 11 and 53, and on and on and on. They wanted to kill him, and the Bible tells us this many times, especially John in his gospel. It was more than just an accusation. They truly wanted to kill him. Uh, As a matter of fact, they didn't stop until they did just that. That's true. But the good news of the gospel tells us that he didn't stay dead either. He arose on that third day. (laughs) Amen. All right. Good lesson today. We have got a question that we've got on our program today. You ready for it? Yeah, I am. What do we have today? (laughs) Sound like a good one. All right, here goes. I am not a Hamas supporter, but I believe Israel is a very godless country as well. So I have wondered if some of what they're facing could be the judgment of God. Do you agree? Okay. This is one of those questions where no matter how I answer it, it's going to seem to be wrong to certain people, depending on your stance, your belief, and even your political affiliation. And there's even some people who would vote Republican who would be anti-Israel. So I'm not putting everybody into one neat little pile, but there's several nuances to this question. I want to take a few moments and just break down a little bit of this. And let me begin by thanking you for your submission to this podcast with your question. Secondly, I do want to identify that I am definitely not a Hamas supporter either. I believe that anyone who supports a group of murderers who hate God, anybody who supports them, they need to be saved, number one, but they're full of the devil to believe that that group could be good in any way. Even the people of Palestine, who supposedly this is who Hamas is fighting for, even the Palestinians do not like the Hamas being there. They're basically ruling over them and making them as slaves under a dictatorship. I have mixed feelings on the part that the questioner said about Israel being godless. I know this is going to be a real technical point, but please, it is very technical. They may not be godless in the sense that you're thinking. I would call them Christless. It appears that God has certainly been in their corner many times through the years. They don't accept Christ, therefore they're without Christ But yet God is still linked to Israel. Allow me to explain. I don't believe that just because a Jewish person is a Jew that they're going to heaven regardless of the life they live. That's what Zionism teaches. I am not a Zionist. I don't believe that all Christians and all Jews are going to heaven. I believe that everybody that's born again is who's going to heaven. Jews cannot be Jewish enough to get to heaven. They got to be saved enough to get to heaven. I'm not a Zionist. I believe you got to receive Jesus in order to make it to heaven. But I do believe that Israel has the support of God behind them. And I know there's a big argument that can be made there. Well, they're Antichrist. They're the biggest Antichrist nation. They're part of the mark of the beast. They're part of this. They're part of that. I understand that the Jews have persecuted Christians as well as any other group has. But yet, the fact of the matter is, is we've got to go to one point. Does God keep his word? If God doesn't keep his word, then we can throw it all away and say, well, they are godless. In a sense, Israel has faced the judgment of God for rejecting their Savior. I believe all of the things that they have faced through the years has come to them because of their rejection of Jesus Christ. In a sense, yes, they're facing judgment. In that same sense, they're godless because they're going to die lost if they don't get converted and believe on Christ. They are not godless, though, in the sense that God made covenants with them And God never goes back on his word. If God goes back on his word to Israel, we can't trust in his word to us. If God would change his mind on one group of people, what would keep him from changing his mind on another group of people? If God would turn his back on the promises and the covenants that he made with Abraham, then he may turn his back on us with the covenants and promises he makes to us. If he's going to keep his word to us who are grafted in, Why would he not keep his word to those who were the true branches? This is a real technical topic, and you can't settle it with one statement or one principle. I know that it sounds like I'm saying something, then contradicting myself, then saying something else, and then contradicting that. But there's so many nuances here. I stand with Israel because God stands with Israel. 
Now, I know a lot of people don't like that. I know a lot of people think that that is too bold of a statement. I know that some people believe that God could never stand for Israel because Israel doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. I believe God will still give Israel another chance to receive Jesus after the time of the Gentiles is over and done away with. Are they facing what they face today because these are judgments of God? Yes. But if you really want to get technical again, America has faced some judgments of God as well. Many people got upset at a couple of major name preachers who said that Hurricane Katrina was the judgment of God on this nation. People got mad. I don't agree with the man or his ministry, but I believe the statement was pretty well correct. Everything that happens that's a tragedy, 9-11, let's go on back. All the different things that have happened, Pearl Harbor, we could go on and on, talk about many things. Could not all of those be judgments of God for a godless society, for a nation that was turning away from God? Every time one of those tragedies happened, America would turn back to God for a time and then turn away from him again. That's exactly what Israel has done throughout her whole creation. Israel would serve God and do good, and then Israel would turn away from God and do bad, and then God would send judgment, then Israel would turn back to God, do good for a little while, then Israel would grow cold and turn away from God, and God would send another judgment. He would send them into captivity. He would send a country against them. He would send disease. He would send pestilence. He would send famine. He would send hunger and strife and all of these things, and they would turn back to God, and they would repent, and they would turn back away from God again. So if you really want to get technical, unless America as a whole is serving God, I don't think that we're any better than the Jews, except for in the fact that most people in America would at least acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah or the Savior. Okay, so now, if you really want to get technical again, we all face the judgments of God here. But whether we ever face it here or not, we will face it at the end of time. Anytime God sends calamity because of our sin, it's part of the judgment of God. If you put Hamas and Israel in the same lump, you really need to be enlightened on their differences. Israel does try to be ethical most of the time. They will try to take care of the civilians that are in the way the best they can. In wartime, when you're dropping bombs and you've got people hiding among civilians, when they're making their base in the basement of the school or a hospital, how do you attack the enemy? Do you just quit attacking the enemy or do you let them reign from the basement of a hospital or do you attack the hospital? You know innocent lives are going to be lost. This is the perplexing positions that Israel's been put into. They stormed a school one day when Israel got close and they hid behind children and women. They used those children and women for their shields and dared the Jews to shoot. They wouldn't do it. A few fired a few shots and a few people lost their lives. But overall, Israel backed down because they didn't want to kill the civilians. This happened a few years ago. And so Hamas was left to keep on doing what they do. And they're a terrorist organization that intends to wipe out Israel first and then America. What do we do? Do we stand with Israel or do we stand with Hamas? If you can stand with murderous people who want to kill God's people that he made covenant with, you can stand with Hamas. But if you want to stand for God and hold to his word and you believe that his word is true, then you have to stand with Israel because God gave them his word that as long as they were a nation and they would turn to him, he would hear their prayers and he would forgive their sins. As long as Israel is a nation, they still have the opportunity to call on God and repent of their sin and be saved. So until that time is over with, Israel still has hope. Hamas denounces Christ. They denounce God. They serve Allah. And they're out to kill anybody who disagrees with their opinion. This could go on for another 30 minutes, and I could explain more and more details of it. But let me go back to the original question and speak to just a couple things quickly. All right, I'm thankful you're not a Hamas supporter. I would encourage you to do more support for Israel over Hamas. I acknowledge both of them have done wrong. Israel is the most pro-LGBT nation in the world. I disagree with that. They're wrong. Israel rejects Jesus Christ. I don't condone that. I'm against that. That's what's going to keep them out of heaven. But to say that God has turned his back on Israel, if he turns his back on them, you better watch out. He might turn his back on you. If you don't believe he'll turn his back on you, then you might ought to reconsider your feelings about Israel because we're all living in a godless society. And thank God we won't be judged for the ungodly. We'll be judged for our own sins. Amen. I've always heard God is God and he always will be God. Remember, friends, if you have a Bible question or a question regarding how news or current events or things going on in our culture are connected to Scripture, 
drop us an email at dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. That's dkministries1977 at yahoo.com. We hope you've enjoyed this episode today, sharing God's Word. But until next time, may God bless you all. Be sure and come back Friday, January the 12th, for special edition number 116, The Culture of Death, with Brother Devin Birdsong. This I know Will it change my heart all around Put my feet back on the ground Got along Now for heaven I want to go I want to go I want to go To that land where the milk and honey flow Oh, I've heard of such a place I can't go there by God's grace Never seen it, but I know I want to go